Hello everyone, my name is John Holgate from Victory Church Cape Town and I would like to introduce this video that we're sending out today on finances. We have put together a fantastic panel of people uh, from all different walks of life, uh, some young, some old, and um, in different times in their careers. And we really want you to engage with this. We, we believe as a church that God has given us everything, that He is our source, He is our provider. And that in this, there are some real practical tips, some practical points that we would love for you to engage with and really connect with. So push pause if you need to, take some notes. There are some absolute gems in there. The panel is fantastic. So we really want to encourage you, listen, go over it, and hopefully this will help you on your journey as you go. Thank you for watching. welcome you this, uh, this day with us. We've got a panel of uh, three friends who are going to be discussing uh, affairs of finances and God's kingdom uh, with us here today. What do you think are the things that people worry about more than anything else? Um, it's quite easy. If you go into a search, you'll find the following. Number one, money and your future. In other words, your financial security. Number two, job security. Number three, relationships. Number four, health. Number five, getting old. And number six, I suppose, uh, yeah, your appearance. Have things changed much uh, since nine, uh, since 2020? The answer is no. You can put COVID at the top of the list, but besides that, you'll still find job security and financial security right at the top of the list. At any given point, somewhere between a third and a half of all people are worried about their financial future. The interesting thing is wealthy people and poorer people worry about it in about an equal measure. So our financial situation is top of mind for most people and it is central to the actions of a particular family that we read about in the Bible and I'll share with you. So let's uh, turn to the well-known account recorded in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. It's an interesting bit of history where two poor ladies cross paths with a wealthy man. The story of Ruth opens with the author describing the situation of this particular family. Elimelech and his wife Naomi and the two sons leave Bethlehem and move to the region of Moab because of a famine. They are in search of food. They are so desperate. They've sold their land and they've sold everything they owned. There's nothing left. So they leave the land of their ancestors in search of relief um, from their hopeless situation. Let's just pause there for a moment. Does it sound familiar when you look at the situation around us in South Africa? People coming to South Africa from neighboring lands, absolutely desperate. People coming from rural areas into the cities looking for opportunities. Going back to Ruth and her family, things are about to take a turn for the worse for Naomi. While in Moab, her husband dies. Both her sons marry uh, women from Moab, and both these uh, husband, or both her sons die at a young age as well. So this leaves Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. All three women are widows. Naomi is in a foreign country, and there's no support for them. Then Naomi hears that the famine in Bethlehem has ended, so she decides to go back. She goes back to Bethlehem. Her one daughter-in-law, Ruth, uh, decides and insists on going back to Bethlehem with her. They get to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So let's just pick up the story and uh, I'll read from Ruth 2, verse 1. It says, There was a relative of Naomi's family, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth, uh, the Moabites, said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him, in whose sight I may find favor. And Naomi says, Go, my daughter. So Ruth went to glean heads of grain. Have you ever wondered what it means to glean, what gleaning is and how it works? How do you go onto someone else's land and actually gather part of the harvest? So let me explain. Gleaning is a custom uh, of following behind the harvesters so that what remains on the field behind the harvesters might be collected by the poor uh, for those who have little means of supporting themselves. So the disenfranchised people in those days uh, were often the widows and the elderly who would no, have no other way to survive. This practice of allowing cleaning was in fact uh, a law of God. Uh, we read in Leviticus 23 verse 22 where it says, And when you reap the harvest of your land, 
You shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so we continue in Luke 2, verse 3, where it says, Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather off the reapers amongst the sheaves. So she came and has continued from the morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go and glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So we have an interesting little episode of a wealthy landowner giving a poor foreign widow an opportunity uh, to get food for her family and, and the extended protection over her. Um, we're going to come back to, to Boaz, Ruth and Naomi in a little while, but I'm going to give an opportunity for our panel to introduce themselves uh, to us before we discuss some interesting topical questions around money and finances. So let's start off in a minute or less. Each of you, can you tell us who you are, what you do for a living and what your typical work week looks like? We start uh, here on my left. Okay, so my name is George Smith. Um, I am a resident of Fisher. I've been here for about 20 odd years and um, <clears throat> I am um, a co-founder of, of two companies. Um, one is more software related and the other one is, is hardware in the automation field. Um, and um, we have a, a, a footprint around the country in terms of the equipment that we put in and the software that we've deployed into companies. Um, and yeah, uh, happily married with one daughter. George, what does your typical work week look like? So um, I'm an engineer by, by, by training. Um, and so a lot of the work is around the type of in, uh, in, uh, equipment that we put into um, businesses um, as well as some of the software. But a large part of it, and, and it wasn't really training that I had in, was really around sales. And so I've had to develop a, a quite a bit of a sales um, acumen and skills. And, and that was the, probably the most difficult part um, in, in starting my own business, um, is just developing an, an, an ability to sell. So I'd imagine that uh, you know the technical side, the, the, the engineering side of things probably takes up about 60% of my time. Admin and sales takes up about the rest. Okay, good. Mark? <coughs> uh, yeah, my name is Mark Edwards. <coughs> I'm also a Fisher resident. I've been here all my life, say for some years now, I was traveling overseas. I started the company um, with some friends uh, in 2013, um, a real estate business, which uh, owns shopping centers and office buildings. And we listed that company on the stock exchange uh, of Johannesburg in 2013. Um, we own properties in, in kind of all of South Africa's major metropoles and also in Croatia. Um, so yeah, my typical work week um, is quite varied. I'm the CEO of the company, um, so it depends. Being listed, it's it's very very regulated, and and so part of the year is doing admin. Uh, unfortunately, my weakest my weakest uh, skill, um, and just ticking the boxes in terms of annual reports and financial statements and things like that on how the properties have performed. Uh, and then a big part of my week traditionally outside of that, or typically outside of that period, would be just thinking. Thinking new opportunities, um, going to look at what I really enjoy is going to look at new properties and putting an office to buy them and seeing what we can do with them and how to, uh, how to turn them around. Um, I love going to Croatia, and that's a real perk, um, and seeing the properties that we have there. Uh, yeah, and, and as much time as I can spend, certainly number one priority is to watch my kids play sports. So <laughs> I would definitely do that ahead of doing any work, <laughs> to be honest. Jared is the younger guy in the group. Jared Pfizer, for those of you who don't know me. Um, 
I finished high school last year, so 2020 I finished, and I'm currently doing a gap year now. Um, and I'm working at a restaurant in Cork Bay called Sirocco, so I'm actually a manager there. I got that job, which I'm very blessed for. So my average week, four or five times a week, I'll probably be doing shifts at Sirocco, I mean Cork Bay. Um, and then I also tutor primary school kids as well, so in my extra time I'll go down next to Port Crayon and I'll do some tutoring there. Great. All right, so let's jump into the uh, financial questions. Do you have or have you ever had a financial goal? If so, at what point in your life did you make that a firm goal? Let me start with you, George. I, th- I think for me, you know, I when we grew up, we we, we never lacked, not in the sense that we were well off. Um, you know, we lived a probably a reasonable middle class existence. Uh, um, but in, in growing up, my parents were pretty astute in terms of their planning. Um, and then after I studied, after I finished studying, I think the, the importance of that became quite clear to me. And, and probably, I'd say probably by my mid-twenties, I realized that it was important to do a little bit of financial planning. At the same time, though, I must say that I, it, it was, I was probably involved in a church at the time that, that felt that financial planning was almost anti-faith. And um, so there was that kind of dichotomy that I, the, those kinds of tussles that I had in terms of just being able to plan and on the other side seeing that some Christians don't see it as, as important. Mm-hmm. But it, it was pretty early in life, and then I started <coughs> developing certain financial goals and, and uh, aims and you know, things, put things in place in order to achieve those. So you don't recall a specific moment, a week or a month in your life which is the game. This is it, and here we go. Well, in terms of, of, of starting business, yes, I think as an engineer, I think you, you're always looking at some things and you're saying, how can I improve things? And um, I, I didn't come from an entrepreneurial background. But I think it was important that I developed these these aspects as I was going through um, the companies that I was working for at the time. Um, but the, the there wasn't a an inflection point. There wasn't a a point where I said, "Okay, this is it. This is mm. this. I need to prioritize this above everything." Maybe more of a journey. Then. It was more of a journey for me. Yeah. Well, you know, for me it was interesting. I remember my first twenty five years of life. Um, I was a bit of a financial disaster zone. <laughs> like uh, there should have been a hazard around me. Um, just from a, a kind of typical teenage and then young adult, um, almost selfish existence. And as an example, when when I was overseas with my now wife, we came back and she had plenty of cash in the bank to bring home. I had nothing, it was zero, because um, I just left it all out there. You know, I had a good experience, and um, it took me a while to to become kind of more financially responsible. For me, it was more, uh, I remember like late twenties, feeling an overwhelming urge, like an entrepreneurial urge to do something, despite the fact that I didn't have money at the time. I was very much a big believer in committing to do something and just doing it, even if it felt better, even if it failed. And then being confident in my own ability that if it failed along the way, that I, I, would, I would just move to a different direction and ultimately it would it would succeed. So certainly God's hand was over my life during the initial 25 years and um, and I I wouldn't change any of that because I think it it, it makes you more appreciative of things that you have now. Um, but yeah, d- definite overwhelming entrepreneurial drive in my late 20s and then with the listing of our current company, I remember going and standing on the steps of the JSC and like we had no business listing this company and, and the year before we were doing it I was visualizing myself when you when you list a business um, you get to blow this very famous coup horn um, at the opening of trade and uh, when you list your company and I would go to the JSC whenever I was in jumping and standing steps and visual, visualize myself blowing that horn and then 12 months later it happened so so yeah I think I think um, for me, it was it was the ability to back oneself entrepreneurially, despite not having any skill, <laughs> just more passion. Um, I think that's what carried me through. Jared, you yeah. sort of want the early part of your of so yeah, your journey. I'm, I'm still very early part now, so I'm in that 25 years now. <laughs> yeah. um, but I do have two examples. So one, I can talk about one goal that I have achieved already, and one that I'm currently on now. 
So two years ago, I think it was 2018, I had a goal. The school I was at, Westford High School, was going on a school trip to Morocco. And it was 50,000 Rand to go, but I couldn't afford it. So I set a goal for myself in grade nine. So beginning of grade nine, because we knew about it the year before. And throughout that year, I basically just worked and fundraised and crafted. So I managed to actually raise that 50,000 Rand by working various jobs. Um, so that was one of the goals I set for myself. And that's in the past. And then the track I'm on now, currently, I have a goal to buy a house. So it's interesting that you're in real estate. Um, but yeah, so the next three years, I want to buy a, a house near one of the universities and then sublet apartments to students. So cool. yeah, that's my idea at the moment. Okay, I think you've all kind of touched on the next question I had in mind, which was keys to success <coughs> along this journey. And I think you've all mentioned or touched on some of the successes. So maybe we'll move on to the next, next one. What distractions or obstacles have you encountered in the management of your personal finances or in achieving your, your financial goals? Have you found anything that's kind of thrown a bit of a wobbly or a spanner in the works for you? In, 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 or maybe a distraction, you know? Uh, George, any thoughts on that? I, th I think for me, it's, it's important to, to stick to your knitting, to, to find out what your initiatives. I know that Mark was saying that sometimes it's a journey in, in uh, okay, plan A has it worked, so possibly there's a plan B, and trying to, to, to isolate and maybe just narrow it down <coughs> to something that is, 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 is true to you, I think, at, at the same time. But um, I felt that sometimes, you know, just sticking to your knitting, finding out what the main thing is and trying to keep that the main thing. Um, so a, a lot of times there are things that come along and, and, and um, I worked for someone who was very faddish in the things that we pursued. Um, and uh, a lot of them didn't work out. Um, and I, I, I learned some lessons there, you know, that if, if, you, if you figure out what you want to do, then try and stick to that. There will be opportunities, you know, that you can use as leverage or as a, a springboard into something else. But try and keep the, the main thing, the main thing, number one. And number two, I think in business, I think especially in your initial days, um, cash flow becomes an issue. And, and how to manage that um, and, and the, 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 the vagaries of those um, can be quite an important lesson that, that we learn. And it's, it's a lesson that you learn not only in business, but it's also a lesson that you learn in, in your personal finances, in, in how do you make sure that you know, the, the salary that you, that you have, you don't overextend yourself and, and, and get yourself into a place where you could get your, in, into debt. So I, I think those are the two things that I'd, I'd probably just touch on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark, any obstacles, this sort of distractions or anything you found in, in achieving your goals? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, now that I'm married, for, I've been married for 18 years, but, but having a wife who's very good financially and much more conservative than I has been, has been a real godsend for me. Um, but I've learned more lessons from Kim than from anybody. Um, just because of the way she approaches things. So um, to George's point, uh, much more budget orientated than I am, etc. So my one advice is to marry up, which Don and I both have. <laughs> 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 um, but secondly, I've come to realize that, um, I mean, it's the old cliche, the most important thing that I have is time. Um, it's considerably more important than finances. But to be using your time productively. So don't kid yourself that that like I, I was very guilty early, and I think it's it's a typical thing from networking and things like that, to say yes to every single event that comes up and to try and spread yourself thin and to sit on this on this committee and this board and this uh, uh, charity. Um, but if one wants to be successful financially, at least I think you need to protect your time. Um, but then with that protected time, you actually need to apply yourself to improve in those time slots, not sit and do nothing and arm around uh, to actually use that time productively. So that for me is a, is a skill I'm still trying to work on. Jared, you achieved quite an audacious goal at, at, at such a young age of raising the finance to go to, to Morocco. I mean, did you find distractions along the way and, and, and how did you deal with that? So distractions, not so much on that. I can't even think back that far, honestly. I remember just working really hard 
and keeping the goal in mind constantly. But I can speak about now, um, my goal now with the house. One of the biggest um, obstacles, in a sense, for me is just that like time goes so slowly. I know it speeds up when you're older, but when you have a goal in mind that's three years out, um, and I'm looking at my budget every week, just looking how much money I'm putting aside for this, it often feels like progress, like there's no progress being made. So that's probably my biggest obstacle that I've experienced so far. It's just to like, keep my eyes on the prize and know that there is actually progress happening um, because it is easy to get dismayed when it doesn't seem to go anywhere. Mm. So different people on their journeys face different um, challenges, you know, and sometimes they see insurmountable. You know, some people, they want to study, there's no money to go study or they want to start a business, they just don't have the capital. You're just looking for a salary job. You can't find a salary job or your business is falling apart due to, to COVID or whatever the case may be. Can you think of the biggest stumbling block that you've overcome in your, in your financial journey and maybe something you want to talk about? So early, early in, in probably about 20 years ago, um, I think the biggest stumbling block that we had at the time was I, we had started a company before myself and, and, and two former colleagues. And um, one of the things that we discovered quite early, we were pretty young and naive and not a lot of skill, but the, the company grew and it, and it grew pretty reasonably and quite a nice little uh, tech. But what happened was that we needed to invest more money into, into the company. And um, the, the other two partners were not too keen on it. Um, I thought we needed to. And eventually we sold the company because we weren't going to be able to fund it from the three of us. There wasn't agreement amongst the, the partners. And, 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 and so we sold the company. And I regret selling. <laughs> 20 years later, I regret selling that company. And, and eventually, again, I joined this other company as a, as a director and I was there for a number of years. Um, but I always wanted to go back then. And, 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 and I think sometimes the lesson that I think I, I want to is, is that sometimes the partners that you choose, just, just make sure that, and it's very difficult, you know, I suppose it's like that in life, you're making sure that you choose the correct friends um, to, to help you on your journey, that they are, they, are, they are friends that are there to encourage rather than to pull you down. Um, and so sometimes you just need to make sure that the people that you go on this journey with mm. are the correct people. And, and, and however you define correct, you know, just try and, 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 and work out what you want out of it and who are the correct people that you want to along on this journey with you. I think that links very well to the point you made, Mark, about sort of you've married the right woman in your life, but other people in your life who, um, you know, help you in terms of just cultivating the right habits. Yeah. Obviously, financial is what we're talking about, but yeah. cultivating good habits around your life generally is very important. Yeah. Mark, obstacles that you've come across um, is something you can think of and, and, and how you dealt with that in the lessons. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose the most, <clears throat> I mean, there are plenty of obstacles along the way, but probably, I mean, the biggest obstacle that everyone can identify with is sort of COVID and how we had to manage the business during COVID with property being obviously dramatically affected, tenants couldn't afford their rentals, et cetera, et cetera, and how. Um, and and how the, the real estate industry, which is quite large, really pulled together. Um, and we were having WhatsApp groups going with all the CEOs and listed companies, and uh, and it really humanised the problems that everybody was facing. Um, so I think I think and and um, having the right team around you, um, personally and from a business perspective, for me at least, was very very valuable. Um, uh, at that point in time, I think one of the lessons I've learned that in a crisis, you need to make sure that you, as you are not the cork in the bottle. Um, that's and 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 often our egos are like we can do everything ourselves, and you know, I'll use this to an example. There's a legal dispute, and Donna and our partners, um, I'm not going to contribute to that argument. Donna's a lawyer; he'll sort it out. But it takes a lot to, for actually people in business to realize that it took me, I'm still learning that lesson to this day, is to stand out, is to actually get out of your own way. Um, and so so for me, certainly the biggest obstacle has been the bump in the road has been COVID, but 
but what's pulled everybody through that has been human partnerships. It's been nothing around financial, it's been nothing around, you know, uh, certainly how strong your balance sheet is and all that is important, but that's driven by humans. Um, and I've got a, quite a simple philosophy in business. I, I don't want to be involved in anyone with anyone that I don't want to have a bribe with. And, and I'm quite selective about who can have a bribe. <laughs> um, and, and that's, I, I think, I think you're definitely going to make some bad calls along the way and maybe someone will do something dodgy to you. But if that's a general approach that you can follow, uh, that's stood me so far. Mm -hmm. Great. Jared, any lessons from overcoming obstacles you faced? So I don't have a lot to say here. I still am quite new on my journey. So I haven't um, experienced any massive obstacles yet. But um, a small one that I was that I dealt with a few months ago was just starting to... I started earning, because I got out of school last year, um, or the beginning of this year. Um, I've only started, I've entered the workforce now, so I started earning money. And the, the small challenge that I needed to know is what to do, like where to put my savings and things like that. So I needed to grow... I need to look into investments and learn all the lingo and all that stuff. So that's still a journey I'm on now. Um, but that's probably the, the obstacle that I'm getting through. Now. Is there any advice or insights that you wish you'd done sooner? <laughs> on that point, actually, yeah, it's a lot of investing, from what I understand now, is like there's a lot of complex investing, but then there's so much of it that's really basic. So like unit trust and things, I didn't realize how basic a lot of it is and how easy it actually is to get involved in that. Um, and I wish like at the beginning of the year in January, I wish I just took the time maybe a day or two to literally just read through, watch a YouTube video or anything, just to see how simple it is and how easy it is to get started and how literally in like a weekend you could uh, set up a savings plan and everything like that. So it's not something. Well, I'm to you, I mean, insights you wish you that gained by advice someone had given you sooner or earlier? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I think just to back yourself, it, it would have been to back myself earlier. Um, I mean, I, as I mentioned, like late twenties, I was quite entrepreneurial, but I look back now and I see like all those, all those opportunities I could have capitalized on at the time. And perhaps I just wasn't confident enough or, um, or maybe it wasn't the right time, but I, I wouldn't have mind, mind putting myself out there a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and you're not going to encounter problems if you stay hidden away. So you've got to actually kind of rip the plaster off um, and back yourself and back yourself with the partners that you trust. Um, so don't worry, the problems are coming. <laughs> <laughs> you experience it. But uh, I, I do agree with what you're saying is that um, often, often, especially finance, it seems so intimidating to people um, because the jargon uh, is difficult to get used to. But my, my brother-in-law was a captain on, he was a captain on the large container ships, and I went to go visit him once, and I was like, Gee, I'm like, fucking overwhelming. How do you even drive this thing? But if I sat there with him for two months in his world every day, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not. Um, Reducing, you probably know how to move the ship. You probably still crash it. But similarly with finance, if he came into my world for the first two days, he wouldn't know what's going on. But after two months, he would understand the lingo, and then he would be able to to do it. So for me, it, it, what you're saying is very important. I keep it, like my advice to you is to is to read about that stuff. Keep reading about it, and and um, the the tools available today are like you can become anything you want to be mm. like just through youtube it's it doesn't incredible have to be it doesn't have to be complex it doesn't have to be intimidating not at all you know they they, they call things you know in finance terms you talk about yields and cap rates and, and interest and amortization and these are like oh these are terribly <coughs> concerning terms but when you actually realize read what they are it becomes quite simple um so yeah i think that's the wrong answer um, yeah don i think if, if I look back at, at, at my high school education and, and, and I think education now from what I understand is I think the big change has been that entrepreneurial ventures it's not that they were that they were that they were frowned upon, but it, it certainly wasn't something that was encouraged or that was spoken about. And and I, I think, you know, if I were to give advice to an eighteen year old me, 
or, or maybe a 15 year old me is is to be inquisitive around those areas and to 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 look at the world out there as 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 an opportunity for something to be made and whether you're going to form an employment initially always be open to the fact that at some stage you may start a side hustle something that is just going to tick along in the background and it's not going to take all your time but eventually it may consume a little bit more of your time um, and, and, and to be inquisitive around that and, 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 and I didn't have that um, it, it took me to my late 20s I think it was um, before I started asking the questions that I think my education center that is I think we can do this better and if, I, if we can't do it better with the vehicle that I've got at the moment maybe I need to look at another vehicle and maybe that vehicle needs to be piloted if, if I want to use that analogy by myself um, and, and, and look at that um, and, and start considering it and I think all of us have been in situations where we're looking at something and we're thinking I think it can be done better and I think I can do it better I just don't know maybe I don't have the tools I don't have the opportunity to start something but I think at, 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 at one level it's almost something innate in all of us to to be almost on top of you know, to, to look for those opportunities yeah we, we, we've spent a, a bit of time now just talking around uh, I suppose the, the the income side of the equation it's just for a moment to talk about the the expense or the, the expenditures out of the equation is there something that you would deal with mentioning where you'd say that was good spent. I really got bang for my buck, taking my money and doing something, whether it's spending on yourself or whatever the case may be, anything that, 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 that jumps to mind. Yeah, for me, just to start off, it's undoubtedly buying my first house. As I hear you talking about saving for your first house, and I credit my wife again here, is that we realized, she realized, and then I followed her lead and then realized that you've got to jump in because um, if, if you don't if, if I didn't if we didn't jump in and take on that bond and pump every cent that we earned into the bond in the early days and we look up, we look back upon those days so finally now where we all we could afford to eat was mashed potato and kidney beans like three four times a week but we managed to buy a tiny house in Sun Valley um, and really fluke time, time the market um, and double our money in two and a half years on that house and we were able to pivot from that house, sell that and then move into our current house um, you know, where we had no business doing that and to me that was absolutely our best expenditure. It, it was almost being the opposite of prudent. It was just being brave um, and you can undoubtedly if you do that you can get your fingers raised. Um, but fortunately, it worked out for us. So, um, yeah, that was definitely our best bet. I, I have to agree with Mark. Um, <coughs> just in terms of that, and, and it's advice that I've given to a lot of young couples as well over the, over the years, and, and that is that the sooner you can get to a stage where you can own your own property, I think it gives a degree of security to the, to the, to the family, to your kids that are growing up, that you don't have to worry about that. The lease comes to an end, and I'm gonna have to move. You know, I have to give all of this up. Um, so, so that's the one thing that I would say, and, and maybe just further, further along that. I think for ever since my teens, um, for me, tithes and offerings, and I use both terms, were um, were important, um, and 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 so I see that not as a grudge, but as important, and 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 we as I, I've always felt that we as Christians, we need to live life that is um, a giving life. That it's it's not a life that necessarily says I will hold for a for a rainy day. It's about making sure that we live life and we look for opportunities where we can be a blessing. And I feel that tithes and offerings is 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 an area that I think we can be a a, a blessing in. So I've always seen that as an as a, as a necessary part of my makeup and, and I'm not going to be religious about it I'm not going to say well it's work for me therefore it needs to work for you so just do it you know, I'm not going to say that um, I'm, I'm just going to say that, that that for me it was important mm. Any thoughts on that uh, Jared? So mine's a bit smaller I'm sharing my few, few years I'm going to agree that it would be my first house 
But um, so far, I spent, I actually went on another school trip to the Orange River, which I paid for myself as well. So that wasn't, it wasn't as big as that Morocco trip. Um, it was a lot smaller. I think it cost 4,000 rand, 5,000, so a lot smaller than that. Um, and that's probably the best um, example that comes to mind. So I really loved that trip as well. And it wasn't like I was blowing the bank on going to Morocco. Good investment on yourself. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Good. I mean, I, I suppose if you were putting in the miles, you know, you sometimes do have to also just enjoy the fruits of your, yeah. of your labor. But we're going to start winding things up. Maybe the second last question, yeah? Um, do you believe that there are characteristics or traits um, that people have in common in terms of those who achieve financial goals? I, I, okay, I, I'll, maybe if I can start. I, start I, I watched a documentary uh, about a week or two ago. And it was on something called the Dunedin um, study. It was a study of about a, a thousand individuals, <coughs> excuse me, about a thousand individuals that um, essentially Kiwis that um, they tracked from a young age through to their adulthoods and into their, into their late adult uh, lives. And, and one, of the, one of the questions that they asked is, what is an early indicator of success? And I was a bit taken aback to hear that one of the earliest indicators of success that they picked up was self-control. And, and I, I thought about it and I thought, well, yeah, I suppose it does because you take, it takes self, it takes discipline, it takes making sure that if you set your mind to something that you, everything else becomes a distraction because you, you, you focused on this one thing. Um, and so I, I'd imagine, yeah, I think I could agree with that. Um, but, you know, for me, for, to expand it a little bit further, you know, it's, it's to have a goal, to have a vision. To make sure that um, you 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 have certain timelines and certain um, milestones along that path to achieve the, the vision and to be disciplined and have self control in achieving it. Um, so I, I'd probably say that is 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 the area that I think I'll, I would focus on myself. Um, and I come from a, a I come from a martial arts background, so I, I did karate when I was when I was younger and you know got SA colors and and and. Um, won some championships early on and I think it was the discipline early on that helped me later on in life but there's there are various ways that you can knuckle down and just be disciplined in the small things studying for an exam um, having um, a goal a financial goal to go on a tour somewhere and and achieving that uh, it, 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 there, are, there are various ways in which you can I think pick up those disciplines in self-control and self-discipline mm -hmm. Great. Jared, Mark, any thoughts on key characteristics people share? Yeah, so I've got, <clears throat> I saw this question and I was thinking about it for a bit. And I think for me, the biggest thing is probably perseverance, because at least in my stage where I'm at now, um, because everyone has to start somewhere and like you're never going to start in the greatest, you're never going to start where you want to be. So you're going to have to persevere through, through working five days a week at a restaurant, dealing with unhappy customers, things like that. So yeah, that quality trait, I would say. Okay. Yeah, and I was going to say that too. I think determination is the most important quality for success, without a doubt. And, um, no matter what obstacles in front of you, you believe that you can go through it or over it or around it. Um, and, and But, but to, determination on its own is, is not enough. Determination needs to be linked with hard work. You, you need to work. And there's going to be a stage in everybody's life, mine was in my 30s, where like for 10 years I worked and worked and worked and worked and worked, late hours, early mornings, etc. And now I don't work like that. But there was that, that time I needed to. And I think if, if one is determined and hard working together, yes, you'll have bad luck. But I think with those two qualities, you, you, will, you will overcome the majority of obstacles uh, from a finance perspective. And the final question to each of you, what would you tell your children or grandchildren to try and influence and shape their financial journey? I think for me <coughs> is, is to have people alongside her, in my case I've got a, a daughter, to, to have, and I have nieces as well, and we've had this discussion um, a few times, is to have a, a team of people, or in, in my case I, I meet, uh, I think once every second month, 
with someone in our church who's a retired businessman. And, and we talk about various things um, because we got to know each other in a cell group environment. So we speak spiritually, um, but because he's a retired businessman, um, he's been able to relate to me and he's been able to impart wisdom and uh, years of experience of, of, of being a businessman and growing a business to the point where, um, at the point where he wanted to retire and to enjoy his autumn years, um, he, he managed to sell the, the business. So I think um, there, there are those kinds of people that you, you, you know from a young age or should know from a young age who you want to align yourself with, who you want to position yourself with, and they may change, you know, depending on the season that you're, you're in. Um, I think it's sometimes important to just be open to the fact that you don't know everything. And so um, Kiyosaki often talks about the fact that you need to have your team around you. And those are people typically that in the, in the legal sense, in the um, retail sp as a space, if, if, for instance, a lot of my work is, 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 is with retailers, um, that I don't know them, that business. In fact, it's, 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 a, it's a side of the business that I am horrified by <laughs> sometimes. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's important to just know that you're not going to know everything, but try and get people alongside you that you, they can actually walk the, the, the walk with you. And it may not be for my child, it may not be me. And I need to be open to that, but she needs to be open to the fact that there needs to be people that she can, who can mentor her, her and that can go along her, with her in this path and this journey that she's going on. Well, you still think about it, Mark? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think two points. The first is the <coughs> biblical principle is, is um, which I still struggle with, is let your yes be yes and no be no. I think if you're able to have determination and hard work and you couple that in, all of a sudden your yes, your yes, yes and your no, no de develops honour and trust, but it also allows you time to follow your your to use your determination and your hard work to give you the time to do that. Um, I think the most important point, and, and, and if I went back to my, when I was 18 or 17, I would sternly lecture myself to, to um, be very, very careful of pursuing a job simply for the money. Is, is if I look at my children now and I see where their passions lie, which will change over time, um, and one needs to be careful not to go off in a direction just because you're passionate at the moment about Fortnite. Now you're going to make a career as a Fortnite. Um, <laughs> but but is is really to encourage people to to follow their passion because there's money then becomes an ancillary um, a byproduct of something that you really really enjoy. Um, and for me that. I, I, I think I think that would be a, a dream environment for a person to be in and only live one life is to be skipping to work every morning. Uh, my dad was a teacher for for uh, many years, and he said, you know, for I think he for forty five years, for forty three of those years, he loved every day of his job. I can't say that about my job, uh, if I'm honest. Um, I mean, there's certain bits of it that I absolutely love. But for two years, he had he, he didn't enjoy it. But but I, I think that's very admirable, mm. um, and and it almost takes the emphasis away from money and money becomes a byproduct that you simply do that. So I'm going to change the question a little bit. <laughs> uh, I was thinking more giving advice to people my age as well. If that's yeah. Right. So I think the best advice I could give is just to like get advice from as many people as possible. So that's something I've done. I've spoken to, because everyone has different experience and expertise. And when you get a little bit from a lot of people, you can pick and choose what you want and you get a broader sense of where you want to go and how to get there. So I think that for me is the most important thing, how I approach it, where I am um, and where I want to go as well. So thanks. All right, so lots of nuggets there. Um, I'm going to circle back to uh, Ruth and, and Boaz and, and Naomi. So I'm going to pick up the story where we left it off. Um, and if you look at Ruth 2, verse 11, it says the following. And Ruth answered and said, sorry, Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband 
and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and the full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even amongst the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat up what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. So I looked it up, an ephah is about, some sources say, 22 meters of dry volume, some sources say, 35 liters, but if you can picture it, she's taken about five buckets full of, you know, domestic buckets full of dry goods back home after a day's work. And then the next day, Boaz gave her another six uh, ephahs of barley, at least 150 liters to take home to Naomi. So you may know how the story develops from there. Uh, Boaz takes Naomi as his wife eventually. And when she falls pregnant, we read in Ruth 4 verse 14 where it says, then the women said to Naomi, who is now going to be uh, a grandmother, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. So Boaz and Naomi called their son Obed, and Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse, of course, was the father of David, who became the king of Israel. And as we know, Jesus was born from the lineage of Jesse and from David. So, when I think about what was said this morning and um, what we can learn from the story of Ruth, what uh, conclusions can we draw from that? I, I suggest maybe three or four. I think number one, Boaz was a wealthy man. Ruth and Naomi came back to Bethlehem. They had nothing and they were basically desperate. Ruth's desperate situation, however, did not disqualify her from being a vital part of God's plan. Ruth ultimately was the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. Um, she was diligent uh, even in her impoverished circumstances. She essentially uh, gave up the familiarity of what she knew in Moab and moved to Bethlehem with her widowed mother-in-law. She looked for an opportunity. She saw the, saw the opportunity to go gleaning and off she went. She took the opportunity with both hands, worked at it with all her heart. Number two, I would say, Boaz, as a wealthy man, was not proud and arrogant about his wealth. He had a heart for the vulnerable and the needy. He used his influence um, and, and his wealth to, ex to extend protection to a penniless foreigner. He used his wealth for good, treating people much in the way that I think Jesus taught us to treat people when uh, his word, where his words are recorded in the New Testament. Then there's a third point. Boaz, Boaz was obedient to God and he honored God's laws. By allowing the gleaning on his fields, Boaz showed that he understood uh, God's commandment to use our money and our resources in a manner that brings honor to his name. In fact, he even went beyond just the simple principle of cleaning and he instructed his young men to drop some of the produce to make it easier for Ruth to gather it. And then number four, as Boaz honored God, we are also called to honor God also with our finances. It is a privilege for us to take what God has given us, including our finances, and to honor him with it. Um, so if you're not really doing so, I would encourage you to, to, to start thinking about the principle of tithing. The, the Bible teaches us about taking a tenth of our increase and bringing it to the storehouse. It is the heart of this particular church uh, to give away to the needy and to our missionaries and to our community projects as much as is available. So you can approach uh, in, any of the people in the, in the church, John O, um, Financial Committee, and I'm sure you'll be encouraged to see um, the heart of the elders of this church in terms of the decisions they are making and how the money that is received is being distributed. And of course, the most tangible way in which we as individuals can demonstrate uh, to ourselves that money does not have a hold over us is to give it away. And what better way uh, than to uh, give it for God's purposes? So just to recap the four points, number one, your circumstances do not disqualify you from being used for God's purposes. Number two, Boaz used his finances for good. Number three, Boaz honored God in his finances and his wealth. And number four, we likewise are called 
to honor God with our finances. So I'd like to thank our panel. Um, I think there's some really good nuggets, some really useful practical tips, and I hope you've uh, enjoyed listening to this session with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.